Good afternoon or good evening, depending on where in the world you're watching from. We're thrilled to be here today to celebrate men who hate women. Um, Laura Bates's brand new book. Uh, my name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Kara Circle. Kara Circle is the uh, nonprofit programming arm of Kara's Books, and Kara's Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. We are really excited to get into this book um, and into a deep conversation. This is a significant contribution to the scholarship around the intersections of misogyny and white supremacy and thinking through the ways that our movements need to respond. Um, so I'm really excited to have Laura Bates here as well as Nancy Jo Sales. So um, I'm gonna introduce Nancy Jo first. So Nancy Jo Sales is the New York Times bestselling author of American Girls, Social Media and the Secret Lives of Teenagers, as well as The Bling Ring, How a Gang of Fame-Obsessed Teens Ripped Off Hollywood and Shocked the World. Her work has appeared in Vanity Fair, New York, uh, The Guardian, and many other publications. Known for her stories on teenagers, social media, and fame culture, she is the recipient of the 2010 Mirror Award, a 2011 Front Page Award, and a 2015 Silurian Award. Her forthcoming book, Nothing Personal, My Secret Life in the Dating App Inferno, is available for pre-order now. So welcome, Nancy Jo. And Thank we're you. Yeah, and we're here today to celebrate the work of Laura Bates. Laura is the founder of the Everyday Sexism Project, an incredible crowdsourced collection of stories from women around the world about their experiences with gender inequality. Laura has received the 2015 British Empire Medal in the Queen's Birthday Honors the WMC Digital Media Award from the Women's Media Center, the Georgina Henry Media Award from the, sorry, the Georgina Henry Prize, and has been named the BBC Women's Hour Power List 2014 Game Changers, and won Cosmopolitan's Ultimate Women of the Year Award. She was also named in CNN's 10 Visionary Women's List. You can follow her efforts on Twitter at Everyday Sexism, and her book, Men Who Hate Women, is available now via this teal button at the bottom of your screen. We would love for you to let, let us know where you're watching from in our comments. And at any time, if you would like um, to please ask a question via this ask a question box at the bottom center of your screen. We love community questions. We will try to incorporate as many as possible. Um, don't be shy. If you are shy, it's okay. We're glad you're just here to listen and learn too, but um, feel free. We really do want uh, as many community contributions as possible. So I'm gonna get out of the way and um, let, let Nancy Joe take it away. So welcome to you both. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Laura, we, we know each other from, you know, talking about stuff over the last few years, but we haven't ever really met if this is, if we can call this meeting. I'm so excited to meet you because you've been so important and inspiring to me as a, a feminist and a writer in the last few years, and I interviewed you for my last book, American Girls, um, I was so happy to see that someone, you, was um, delving into what is really going on in the lives of girls and how they are still subjected to such sexism and uh, abuse, particularly online, which has been my focus as well. And now you've written this amazing book, which I've read, and absolutely blew me away. Thank you so much for writing this book. It's so important that people really understand what you're saying in this book. And what you've been able to do, I feel, is to, um, through analysis, reporting, and historical, you know, uh, investigation to show the development of what we now call the manosphere, the online manosphere. Now, why don't you, for people who aren't really familiar with what that is, just sort of lay it out. What is the manosphere? A lot of a lot of our viewers might be familiar with the word. Some might not be. But this is really your your main subject matter. So so just talk about that for a minute. What what are we talking about here? Okay, thank you so much. I'm such a fan of your work as well, Nancy Jo. So this is a real honor to be in conversation with you. Um, so the manosphere is a, um, it's a kind of quite um, euphemistic name, I think. It isn't my term, um, but it is the term that is in use to encompass um, a, a connected network of many different communities, many of them with roots online, but also with large offline presence in some cases, less so others. These are communities which uh, many people are not aware even exist. Um, and those who do know that they exist tend to dismiss them as fringe groups 
of weirdos who should be pitied rather than feared and who have very little offline influence. And really none of that is true, as I discover in the book. So we're talking about communities almost exclusively made up of men, heavily populated by uh, young to middle-aged, college-educated white men specifically, and their communities united by a hatred of women united by extreme misogyny, united by uh, stereotyping and dehumanization of women to sexual objects. These are communities who all really believe that women are evil, that women are solely on this planet to give sex to men, to reproduce, to raise children. And they have different ideas about how to reduce women to objects in that way. So you have pickup artists, one section of these communities, these are men who operate within a hundred million dollar international industry. So this is a huge, completely unregulated industry where men around the world are paying thousands of pounds in boot camps on and offline, essentially to be trained in how to sexually harass at best and at worst sexually assault women by men who in many cases, the leading lights of this industry raking in thousands of pounds are themselves men who have admitted or boasted about committing rape or men who have advocated for rape to be legalized. So these are men who believe that women are sex objects and there is a specific combination of tricks that any man can learn to force them into having sex. Then there are men who want to be having sex but aren't, and these guys call themselves incels or involuntary celibates. In other words, they want to be having sex and they're furious that women aren't giving it to them. These men have a different strategy, so rather than believing that it's possible to kind of trick women into having sex with you, they often believe that it's futile, that there's a vast feminist conspiracy, which they call a gynocracy, that the so-called sexual marketplace is hopelessly rigged against them, and that women really ought to be reduced to government mandated sexual slavery. They talk about the redistribution of sex because it's what men deserve. It's their birthright, if you like. These men are so angry about their situation that they believe that incels should rise up in what they describe as a day of retribution, an incel uprising or rebellion, when they will massacre women, particularly younger, sexually attractive women, to punish them for not having sex with them. And if that sounds really extreme and just off the wall, I think it's important to say that these men have done just that repeatedly, from Elliot Rogers, Santa Barbara massacre, to Alec Manassian's Toronto van attack, to a number of other attacks. In fact, in the book, I trace this explicit ideology to the murder or serious injury of over 100 people in the last 10 years. So that's incels and pickup artists. I don't know, do you want me to go on with the other communities or? I do, I do. I wanna hear about all of them, but I just want you to stop on Elliot Roger because I think that he's so central um, to this whole discussion because mm -hmm. he's become sort of the, um, you know, ideal, the patron saint of, of the yeah. incel movement. And a lot of people still, even though he's he's so central and he's so important to this discussion in terms of what he represents to these men, I think he's not on everybody's radar in terms of his influence. So I, could you just go into Elliot Roger a little more and, and let people know who he was, what he did, and how that figures into the modern, in, the, the current incel movement? So Elliot Roger was a young man who was um, furious that he wasn't having sex. And he was also fairly socially isolated to a degree. Um, he was somebody who had various social problems, which in the press were very much built up in the aftermath of what he did. But very specifically, he was extremely active in online communities about pickup artistry and then later in an online community called Pick Up Hate. It's quite a good reflection, really, on the ways in which these communities intersect, because in some ways they have a lot in common, but in other ways they really clash. So many incels are furious with the concept of pickup artistry because they think it sells men a false promise that it's possible to get women to have sex with you. And in Elliot Rogers' case, he believed that it wasn't. He wrote... Mm -hmm extensive hundreds of thousands of word long manifesto online saying that he would slaughter every spoiled stuck up blonde slut who had refused to have sex with him and in well, 20 putting women in concentration camps essentially as mm -hmm. as breeders to continue human beings but he wanted women to actually be contained and confined in camps 
right and he turned up at a sorority house explicitly targeting sorority women members who he felt had refused him sex he was also explicitly furious about women having sex with black men which i think is really crucial because there is a huge racist element here and he took a gun and massacred as many women as he could he started shooting outside a sorority house and then he got in a car and and drove mowed down as many people as he could um he eventually um i i, I think he eventually took his own life as police approached his car yeah. um so he murdered six people and seriously injured 14 and to say it's really important to, to note that these communities revere him they elevate mm -hmm. him so sainthood they talk about and yet, him and yet with 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 the manifesto out there with him explicitly stating that he wanted to kill women um still the news coverage at the time which i believe was 2014 correct yes was all about how he was mentally ill and in yes. fact when i spoke to an editor involved in my last book american girls about you know girls and online social media and everything and sexism I said, well, we have to talk about Elliot Roger. And she said, oh, but isn't he really just mentally ill? Mm -hmm. And it was so shocking to me that this was, you know, so dismissed at that time. It's now we're seven years later, but people were still, the mainstream media was still talking about him like he was just some kook. And, you know, yeah. some some kook who went off with a gun. But right. really, it was it was much more significant than that. It was, and he had been absolutely radicalized online and groomed, although we don't use those words to describe it, just like we don't describe terrorists like Elliot Roger as a terrorist. Um, he had never been formally diagnosed with any mental health problem. He had seen mental health professionals, but that certainly wasn't a cut and dried case. And the radicalization and the extremist misogyny, which he left behind in a very lucid and extensive manifesto, was rarely mentioned in the press. We saw them talking about him as a Lone Wolf as an outlier. Um, there was extensive coverage in major mainstream platforms that described him as troubled, that talked about him being bullied at school, as the media does with any white male mass attack. As, as if we needed to, you know, be concerned for him. Right, exactly. Because, you know, and and for his his, you know, that poor boy, instead of all those poor women, and I think he killed a couple of men too, incidentally, as he was shooting. Yeah. You know, interesting too about about him and about that is in 2015 I did a, one of the first you know major media stories to criticize dating apps, and after it came out, it was in Vanity Fair. I got a lot of emails and and stuff from really misogynistic men who self described as incels, yeah. and um, they felt that this whole online dating you know revolution that was happening revolution i say you know advisedly um you know this isn't like a good revolution yeah. they they felt that the promise of of online dating was that they could now get sex mm -hmm. because that was what it was for for them to get sex for men to get sex and i just thought it was so interesting that that is the focus of the the types of men that you're you're talking about is that they feel that they are entitled mm -hmm. to this. This was Elliot Rogers' whole obsession. He felt like he was entitled to have sex with women. Why don't they like me? Not, I mean, of course it had nothing to do with his personality in his mind or that he was, you know, really weird, but you know, so um, continue on and let us know what are the other areas that you, you studied and you covered in terms of the manosphere. So another community is called Men Going Their Own Way, or MGTOW is the acronym that they use and how they pronounce it for short. These are men who believe that women are so toxic and dangerous and evil. They're men who are extremely focused, for example, on false rape allegations, which they consider to be extraordinarily common. They see the Me Too movement. Not, which we should say are not common at all. Absolutely, that's very important to say. They're extremely uncommon. They are very focused on the idea of the Me Too movement, for example, as a witch hunt designed to rip white men from their lives and careers. They believe that the majority of fathers are actually raising children who aren't their own because they've been tricked by promiscuous women into raising other men's kids. And they, the way they land on this is that the safe thing for men to do is to cut women out of their lives altogether, to have nothing to do with women. So 
socially, personally, professionally, romantically. And again, I think when you hear this, it's really easy to think, oh, you must be talking about a tiny handful of men. But the truth is that we're actually talking about men who are um, extremely prolific online. There are forums with tens of thousands of these members who are men going their own way. There are individual MGTOW vloggers on YouTube who have 60 or 70 million views of their videos. And in a recent study, 27% of American men now say that they avoid having a one-to-one -one meeting with a woman in the workplace. So actually this idea, don't be alone with a woman, she might accuse you of rape and ruin your life, has become much more prolific and has leaked very successfully into the mainstream without us necessarily knowing that it's being driven by this, this very niche online community. And the other group that I look at particular, particularly in the book is men's rights activists. And the terminology here, the men's rights movement, men's rights, it suggests a, a powerful and a positive force. It suggests that these are men who care about real issues and they do use those issues as a kind of shield or a veil for their real activities. So they pay lip service to very real issues affecting men, issues like the male mental health crisis, issues like support for veterans or tackling workplace injuries or male cancers, but they spend absolutely no time actually trying to deal with those issues. Instead, they are very much prominently doubling down on the idea that the old outdated gender stereotypes should be adhered to, that men should be powerful, that they should be in control of their women. These are men who have, for example, advocated renaming Domestic Abuse Awareness Month Bash a Violent Bitch Month. These are men who spend their time bringing frivolous lawsuits trying to undermine frontline sexual violence services or um, frontline or um, lawsuits against the Equality Act, for example. So they're very vicious and they're very misogynistic, but they're also quite clever at gaining mainstream attention and news coverage behind this kind of very fake veil of, of fighting for a just cause. They are very good at doing something that throughout the manosphere is, is done, which is kind of inverting the reality of privilege and oppression. So they take a privilege group and they position them as the oppressed. They talk about white men being the true victims of today's society and they're extremely adept at gaining mass media attention but also working with political parties. So there is evidence in the US, in Australia, in the UK of these groups in particular who are the kind of acceptable or respectable public face of the manosphere gaining an audience and even gaining real traction and influence with mainstream politicians which then some of those people that you're referring to. So Let for, us know. Example, both, for example, um, met with one of these groups and then uh, did mm -hmm. sort of Betsy DeVos. Oh, education. She met with one of these groups and then brought out new guidelines around campus rape allegations that essentially kind of protected perpetrators and rolled back provisions for survivors. Here in the UK, we have a member of our uh, Women and Equalities Committee in Parliament who's actually regularly speaking at men's rights conferences and saying that actually the legal system is stacked against men and women want to have their cake and eat it and feminism is all about taking men down. He regularly stands up in Parliament and filibusters to prevent prevent acts passing which are about supporting women for example tackling domestic abuse so actually we're seeing these groups get quite a kind of firm stranglehold in terms of their impact on political representatives uh, we know from a Cambridge Analytica whistleblower uh, Christopher Wiley that Steve Bannon actively courted the votes of incels as a specific demographic when he was advising Donald Trump's presidential campaign so these groups are very good at kind of getting the ear of, of policy makers and people in positions of power. And sometimes they are people in positions of power. So there is an example of a major forum um, about men who are red pilled. So this is an, a, a, a metaphor used by some of these communities. It, it takes its name from the scene in The Matrix, where if you take the red pill, you'll suddenly see the world the way it really is. And this was a forum which was a kind of melting pot of manosphere ideas, where the person running the forum had written, for example, that um, rape isn't all bad because at least the rapist enjoys it, where he'd written that um, feminists are just mad because they wish that they weren't too ugly to rape. And this guy was a serving representative in the US. So this was a serving politician. So in many cases, the links are um, much less kind of hazy than we might like to think. And that's men's right. rights activism. Right. And, and I think that, um, you know, for people who are uneducated 
in these matters. There is a widespread misconception, I think, that feminism is a kind of um, forward movement that always makes things better and better and better. And that, you know, things have gotten better for women, so there's really nothing that needs to be done anymore. And I've seen studies that say that the majority of actually millennial men think this. Um, and I've heard, you know, women my age, I'm in my fifth older women, well, you know, Gloria Steinem fixed all that, so we're good. It's just so important to know that this is happening because in my, to my mind, what I see happening is that we are under threat, you know, to our, our liberty and our, our well-being in ways and a safety in ways that have never existed before in my lifetime because of because of the online activity of these men and you you've just brought up this uh connection between these groups online and now how they have been moving into politics and when we were speaking before i, I was telling you how disturbed I was in, in doing interviews with girls. Whenever there were boys around, there seemed to be a lot of nationalistic talk and jingoistic talk. You'd be in a group of boys and they'd suddenly start going, USA, USA. Um, these are sort of, you know, really frat boy types and 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 kind of, uh, you know, these sort, sort of guys that you talk about as being radicalized online. Do you want to say a little more about how, the, the connection, which I think is so important to bring up between these movements and white supremacy and um, far right politics and how that all works. Absolutely, yes. I think this is really key because it's something that's very often overlooked. And sometimes people are making the connections, but they're talking about them as if these are two completely separate problems, separate movements, and there are some links between them. The reality, I think, is that we have to see this as part of the same whole. They're not just linked. They are literally part of the same the same beast, the same network, the same problem. So throughout the manosphere, there is extreme racism. We are talking about a disproportionately white male group. They are generally college educated men. And these are men who are extremely racist. They're not just furious that women aren't having sex with them. They don't want women specifically to be having sex with non-white men. And if you look at the kind of language and terminology, of the manosphere, which has really its own lexicon, you can see how that is now built into and very much a foundational part of the language and terminology used within white supremacy and white nationalism. And that's no surprise because actually these groups are seeing misogyny and anti-feminism as a recruiting tool, a kind of slipway, if you like, to white nationalism. They think it's an easy sell and they talk about this very openly amongst themselves online. They say, if we can get guys, if we can recruit teams teenage boys into this anti-feminist, misogynistic hatred, then they see it as a way to, as they describe it, add cherry flavor to children's medicine. They use these sexist memes and jokes and viral videos and banter, and then they very gradually, it's they're going down this kind of rabbit hole, and they see it as a recruitment, a way to get them into white supremacist, neo-Nazi, far right groups. And you can see that very clearly in the trajectory of the careers, if you like, of some of the men who have become leading lights or frontal figures within white supremacist movements. Men like Mike Cernovich, for example, is a good example of this. Men who are now very involved in those movements or considered to be who made them their name in misogynistic hate movements online, like the Gamergate campaign, for example. And it's also impossible to look at white nationalism and white supremacy and not to recognize, although many don't, that it is inherently built on a foundation of extreme misogyny. So if you look at somebody like Anders Breivik, for example, the Norwegian white supremacist, his manifesto started with the three sentences, it's the birth rates it's the birth rates, it's the birth rates. These men are obsessed with what they describe as replacement theory. In other words, they're obsessed yeah. with the idea that there is a fragile commodity of dehumanized white women being plundered mm -hmm. by invading non-white men. They feel that women should be utterly reduced to sexual slavery and forced to uh, procreate, to produce a, a master race of white children. They believe that women of color should be forcibly sterilized. It is inextricably bound up in extreme misogyny, just as the manosphere is inextricably bound up in extreme racism. But I think 
we really struggle to make that connection and to see that link between them, which which hampers us in tackling these movements. And nowhere was that more clear than in the recent tragic shootings in Atlanta, where it was very difficult for the mainstream media to recognize that there could be both misogyny and racism at play, that hypersexualized stereotypes of submissive Asian women play into a deeply racialized and misogynistic form of hatred. And the fact that it was so difficult for them to recognize that crossover showed I think how far we are from really seeing the bigger picture here. Yeah you know um, now that we are at this moment and, and looking back and things which I've done a lot recently because I wrote a memoir that involves you know looking back at growing up as a little girl in America and the kinds of things that I was shown and absorbed um, and what made me a feminist but what also conditioned me to have internalized misogyny there's just so much. And, and I think that it's so important for people to understand the connection between that offhanded comment on a, on a talk show in the 1970s, even some men who were considered, you know, really progressive, like Dick Cavett or something, focusing on women's appearance or focusing on, on their sexuality, their sexual appeal or something, you know, um, how that, you know, there's like this relationship to all of this. And you see it and, and you think this wasn't just what made me who I am and all the, all the, you know, struggles that I've had, but also this is what bolstered the racism in this country as well. You know, this isn't, this wasn't just, this wasn't just demeaning to women. This was demeaning to all others, you know? And so I wanted you to um, just talk a little bit more about what happened when you went undercover you talk in your book about going undercover and and being part of this and that's really fascinating go into that a little bit and tell people what you did so I wanted to show what the experience was for young men of being sucked into these movements because I think yeah, how, it, how it works tell people how, how do they get there I think when people hear about this, they think, oh, well, this doesn't apply to my child or a young person that I know because they wouldn't go looking for a website like this. So it's kind of irrelevant. Well, the that reminds me of like when people say to me, like, well, my son doesn't watch porn. Right. He, exactly. he would never watch porn. He would never watch violent porn. And then they go and check the phone because they get it in their mind, like, well, is he? And then I've gotten emails where they say, well, actually, he's watching it like three times a day. What do I do? So yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I think that's so true. I think that there is a real unwillingness to confront this, which is understandable, comes from an understandable place. But I wanted to demonstrate by creating this persona of this young guy called Alex, um, how, how cleverly it can happen without you really even realizing it. So Alex was a very... Um, a very normal young guy. He was in his early 20s. Uh, he was white. He was educated. He really would have liked to be more successful with women than he was. He didn't have a great job, but he had a job. And he was distinctly- your avatar, Alex. Yeah, this was the guy. This was the, the persona I created. Um, and he was somebody who um, was really uncomfortable with the idea that the media kept seeming to say that guys like him were privileged. And he really didn't identify with that word. And it made him feel a little bit kind of got at. And so I took him online, but I took him into the places where young men hang out. So he wasn't going looking for incel websites. He was on YouTube and he was on 4chan. Mm -hmm. He was on generic chat forums. He was on gaming websites. He was live streaming. And very, very slowly, little comments started popping up they are on live stream so they're on they're on your headphones when a teenager is on his own in his bedroom playing with somebody that he's never met before somewhere else around the world is whispering in his ear and they start by dropping out just kind of trawling really they drop out these little feelers these sort of sexist jokes and banter the kind of thing that they can brush off as nothing if somebody objects but if somebody takes the bait then they kind of probe a little further and things start to get very slightly more extreme and then perhaps there's a link to a private gaming strategy chat room and in there the conversation gets a little bit more kind of locker room banter and there's a little bit more misogyny dripped in and then from there maybe it's a normalization the normalization of these of these exactly. ideas and comments 
Yeah, so basically it happens very slowly over a long period of time and it starts out as irony and banter and jokes. And they very deliberately describe this process where somewhere along the way it stops being a joke, but you couldn't put your finger on where that happened. And so it's normalized, it becomes the kind of wallpaper of the world that a young person is hanging out in. And by the time you reach the end point where these guys are saying you should go and buy a gun and go out and massacre young women you know who haven't had sex with you, it's happened so slowly and gradually that it doesn't seem so shocking anymore because you've been desensitized to this rhetoric. And that was very much how it was described to me by guys who had lived it. There was a um, one incel that I spoke to, former incel, who had started on these websites when he was 11. That was when he started hanging out in the kind of 4chans and the 8chans. And he started getting these links and this kind of banter. And he felt that he was in a world that was a space for men to blow off steam, for guys to be guys, to hang out without worrying about what the PC woke snowflake brigade would say to police them, to say inappropriate things that they didn't really mean and to support each other and for a sense of solidarity and community and purpose. And all of these things appeal, they appealed to this character Alex I created because suddenly, instead of being this kind of loser on the outside, in this world, Alex was an underdog, he was oppressed. He was a downtrodden white man who was fighting back for what was his and what he was entitled to and what he deserved. And he was one of a band of brothers in arms who had this cause and this purpose. And you can see how seductive that is. And for this kid who was just 11 when he started, he said by the time four years down the line, he found himself in an incel forum and he'd never had a girlfriend and it appealed to him. It felt like these guys were his friends. This was his community. So when they talk about murdering and raping women, sure, it's a little extreme, but you've made so many sexist and racist jokes by that point that it's kind of just part of the vibe. And at that point, you've kind of sucked some Somebody in to a point that's sort of unrecognizable from where they started. But it's very cleverly done. It uses memes and cultural touch points and jokes about movies that people have seen. And so it's all joke, joke, joke until suddenly one yeah. day it's not a joke. And, they, and it makes them feel cool and it makes them feel like they have power. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what they want. And they, they have community and they feel like they belong. Right. And that's that's what they're looking for, you know, even in, in this really misguided kind of way. You know, what I've it, it's so similar in a lot of ways to the grooming that happens of girls by predators. Mm -hmm. really. yeah. these, these people who are, are are exploiting these young kids are predators in a sense, you know, not necessarily sexual predators, although there's probably some crossover there as well. Um, but they are, they're grooming them in this way where their parents might not ever know that their mind is being, becoming something that their parents wouldn't even recognize. Yeah. And I'm so often asked, and I don't always know the answer, but I'll, I'll, I'll put it to you. What, what do, what do parents do? Because, you know, my, my, what I always want to say is, well, don't give them a phone. But it's really, I mean, especially not when they're six or eight or 10, you know, you know, doctors now say, agree that the, the screen time should be kept away from them as, as long as possible. But it's really impossible at this point to keep computers away from kids. So what, what would you suggest that parents do? I think trying to prevent them from accessing or viewing this stuff is a losing battle. And in a way, it just makes it more seductive and exciting. You know, it's contraband then. I think what's much more realistic and much more effective is to give them the tools to handle it, preferably from a very young age before they become exposed to it. It's very difficult to de-radicalize somebody, but it's much easier to prevent it happening in the first place. So the first thing to be aware of is that sense of what boys are finding seductive in these communities, which is that sense of belonging and uh, camaraderie and purpose and to give them that elsewhere offline. So to encourage them to be involved in offline groups, to meet boys, to have friends who are guys offline, to be involved in community groups, to go along to youth centers and to make sure of course at a government level that those resources are available and funded because giving them offline spaces which are more productive and healthy can offer some of those same elements that are very seductive in the manosphere. For parents what I would say is that many of these boys are extremely vulnerable and they're starting out from a position of having anxieties and questions about sex and about girls that aren't answered elsewhere. 
So a heartbreaking example of this is a bodybuilding forum where incels had infiltrated this forum because they knew that this was a place where they would find a self-selecting group of boys who are already very concerned about traditional masculinity, right? And portraying mm -hmm. It. And on this forum, you've got these guys asking these these simple these questions like, how do I flirt with a girl? How do I get a girl to like me? There's this girl I like, and they're 13 or 14. And the responses are adult men saying to them things like, rape it. Or every woman has a rape fantasy. You're just playing into it. Take what's yours, man. Don't let her talk back to you. Start smacking her early on and she'll always know which side um, of the bed to get out of. You're seeing these, these men giving them this very extreme advice. So the first thing to say is that if boys have somewhere offline where they can have those conversations in a healthy and a safe and a supportive space, then they're much less vulnerable to be preyed on in these spaces. So we need to see really comprehensive and up-to-date sex education in schools that's based around oh, yeah. of and course and and, and 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 education about porn too i mean porn is really a part of this too i think because yes. they are seeing women you know sure. being physically abused yes and it's so normalized yes and, in fact we have the research and, objectified and normalized and, and everything and and these conversations can really start when um you know as soon as they get a computer as soon as they get a phone and they don't have to be some scary thing. Like, we're going to sit down now and talk about this big, huge issue. Like, you can be stirring the spot, pot of spaghetti and just say, hey, what you do online today? You seeing anything interesting online? I mean, it can become, I think it has to become a part of the casual conversation of growing up in a household in order to give them, like you say, the analytical tools with which to protect themselves from these kind of um, mental predators. But, you know, also I think schools need to incorporate more um, feminist education. Even to this day, you know, we, there's, I just read a recent study that said that something like 0.05% of history that's taught in schools is about women mm -hmm. still now in 2021. Yeah. And that's just insane because without learning in school that women are leaders and writers and and scientists and you know do great things and uh save people's lives and are, are you know do all of these wonderful things that women do mm -hmm. um they have nothing to use as a reference a frame of reference for like this you know this dystopian crap about how women are just objects and they're just to be pardon the expression raped and all, all that yeah, absolutely. So schools are schools are to schools sh should read your book and take note of what you're seeing as well. And and they need the resources and the training to to know how to respond. I think part of the problem is that we don't consider this a form of grooming or radicalization, even though that's what it is. So if we had it, if counter extremist organisations and counter extremist, um, you know, government level um, were looking at this as a form of grooming and radicalization into terrorism, if these men were ever charged or described as terrorists, then we might be able to recognise their grooming of young men as in, a significant enough cause for concern to properly train and resource schools and teachers to tackle it. And at the moment, that's completely missing. But there's well, it's not even thing. called domestic terror. It's not even called terrorism. And in fact, you domestic know, it's not terrorism when it's people killing people and, and mass. And, and for a specific political reason, right, to, to cause terror. I mean, in the same way that we are still catching up with recognizing white supremacist terrorists as terrorists, and we still in the media coverage there as well, a Muslim terror attacker is 400% more likely almost to receive coverage at all in the first place, or even to hear about what's happened. But even then, we're seeing white supremacist killers still excused. We're seeing this sympathy and kind of understanding, trying to look for a motive in a way that simply doesn't happen for other groups. Sort of the same right. sort of narrative that happens when a woman is raped. You know, exactly. oh, what happened to this poor boy's life? You know what? Before we did this, you you directed me to. I see a lot of comments and things. Should I be looking at the questions? Should I be taking questions now? Because I don't um, leave anybody out who, who has a question for you that I'm not asking. Should I look we, at the questions? We can. We can. Until the end. What do uh, you prefer? So, do you want me to read the questions? I can see them. Yeah. I can read them. Okay, great. Yeah. Is this what I'm supposed to be reading? I'm sorry. These are all very nice comments. In I, I don't know. Oh, three questions. That's it. Questions. Oh, 
Do you, okay, okay, I'm gonna ask the first one. Do you know why these groups have not been branded, why they have not been branded as hate groups, flagging them and potentially dismantling them? So they, they definitely haven't. Um, I spoke with many counter-terror organizations as part of the prep for this book as the research, and I would ring up and literally in some cases, I asked them about incels, for example, and there was a pause at the other end of the line, and then they asked me, sorry, can you spell that? And then they rang me back maybe a week or two later and said, no, we don't have any information on that. I found a, a well, government- what, what agency was this? What, like this was one of the main UK counter-terror um, government organizations. And they didn't know what incels were? They didn't seem to have heard of incels. And in the US, there's a US government accountability report on tackling extremism, which is literally about how well the country is doing in tackling these threats. And over the 10 year period of the report, which is recent, there were um, different organizations that they were flagging and following up and, and, and watching. And they included extremist groups like those with extremist views about animal rights, uh, about federal ownership of public lands, about a whole number of other things. But there was nothing in there about gender zero on this. And in the 10 years that that report covered, in many of those cases, nobody had been killed or injured in the name of the forms of extremism they were tracking. But there have been three incel massacres in that period that the report didn't catch, didn't pick up on. So if it's not it's even- growing right, and It's getting worse because nothing's being done about it nothing's being done and we're seeing increasing numbers of copycat murders and attempted murders in the states in particular but also in Canada men who have been arrested and it's been found that they have um they've been groomed online by incels and that they have um intent to carry out terror attacks well, who was Alex Manas is that how, how do you pronounce in the Toronto van how do you pronounce his name Manassian Manassian yes. yes he he didn't he say as he killed people death to all the stacys now explain what a stacy is so incels a part of their kind of terminology is that they describe sexually attractive women who they see as quite promiscuous as stacys and the men that they have sex with who incels think are the kind of top few percent of sexually yeah. attractive men as chads so they feel that those people should be massacred to punish them for the fact that they're having all of the sex. And Alec Manassian, as you say, used some of this terminology. He left behind a statement online saying that the incel rebellion had begun, referencing Elliot Roger. And after his arrest, he then told police that he'd been radicalized by incels online and that he'd tried to kill these women. 80% of his victims of the 10 people he murdered were women. And yet he wasn't charged as a terrorist. In fact, the police came out and gave a press conference shortly afterwards where they said there appears to be no terrorist link here. Only once ever has a man been charged with a terror offense after committing an incel attack. It's so frustrating because, you know, as as women, we hear these things and, well, not all women, like I said, I had an editor who said, well, it wasn't me just crazy, you know, like, I, but but as as women, generally, we hear these things and, and we know why. I mean, we, we, we know why they're not being charged because, women don't matter enough mm -hmm. to look at, I, I mean, women matter plenty, but you know, in the eyes of authority yeah. figures and law enforcement and, 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 and the powers that be, women still, this is just another sign and, and so frustrating and upsetting that we don't matter enough to be taken seriously yes. as victims of, of mass shootings, you know, like you can't be identified as people that, pe you know, these guys want to kill. And that's the answer to the question, right? Why have these groups not been branded as hate groups and dismantled? misogyny is the daily wallpaper of our lives because yeah. one in three women on the planet will be raped or murdered in her lifetime. So the fact of a man massacring women it's normal. We struggle to see it as extreme. And somebody has said in the comments here, I can see that women are the canaries in the coal mines for mass shootings. And that's exactly it. So in 54% of US mass shootings, um, one a, a woman or a, a female family member is one of the victims, usually one of the first victims. And we know that around a third of mass shooters in the US has a history of domestic abuse or violence against women. Yes, and not to mention these figures are just not discussed. Connected, right? But there and are there are murders of in the in America. There's murders of I think two women every single day. Two point right. something. I mean yes. that's not, uh, yeah. that's not. A, let me let me see what else is, are people asking. These are such good questions. Um, 
You mentioned the role, oh, this is interesting. This is a good question. You mentioned the role of ironic humor, which is very, you know, I know I have a Gen Z daughter, so it's very Gen Z, this nihilistic ironic humor. I mean, I love her, she's perfect, she's fantastic. I'm not putting her down, but that is just a, a Gen Z thing, this ironic humor. You mentioned the role of ironic humor as one strategy informal recruiters use online to normalize more extreme language and behavior. Feminists and people on the left uh, correctly, I think, focus on the importance of language as having power for this very reason. Words have meaning. Ironic jokes lead to make more straightforward avowals of hate. Yet it often feels that our insistence on the power of language is mocked and derided as cancel culture or PC snowflake culture. How do we exit that cycle? Wow, what a good question. It's a great question. I think the answer has to be nuance and context. You know, nobody is saying that no one can tell a joke anymore. That isn't the point of feminists when they try to talk about the power of language. But if we are talking about a generation of young men where this is being used as a very sophisticated grooming technique, then in that context, it is something that really matters. And I think part of it is finding a way to make that conversation nuanced and to make it clear what it is that we're talking about. But that's an uphill battle when it's become a very easy weapon to turn on the kind of supposedly woke snowflake generation that they can't take a joke that they're making a fuss about a single word and so on and that isn't an accident right there is huge crossover in terms of who has the power in the media media interlocutors high profile speakers and people who kind of if you like pedal manosphere extremism in a slightly sanitized more respectable form for the masses one of the things that they trade on and that the manosphere subsequently goes wild for and rewards them with likes and clicks is these arguments that help to protect online extremism arguments like it's freedom of speech, everybody has the right to freedom of speech. I think often there just isn't nuance in those conversations. For example, freedom of speech doesn't include the right to incite hatred and violence, but many people seem to think that it does. When we're talking about the freedom of speech of, of white men to be racist and misogynistic online, we are not talking about the freedom of speech of the women of color, the trans people, the disabled activists who are essentially being silenced because those online spaces are becoming so unsafe for them that they are not able to participate in the conversation. So no, we're not saying nobody can ever make a joke. There's no such thing as irony. Banter's not okay. But we are saying if we've reached a point where banter is such a very bulletproof veil for offense and essentially for inculcation of racism and hatred that the president of the United States can sort of talk about locker room banter and, and excuse the fact that he incited people to grab women by the pussy, then there's a problem there. And then was elected, yeah. 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 So I think I, um, I, I want to just interject. I know there's another question here about uh, what do parents do, and that's that seems to be on a lot of people's minds. And and so I just want to jump in with one thing that that I I've noticed that that might be a little bit useful. So and also relates to language. So I you know I, I write about social media and, and kids and and now dating and the internet and young women and and dating apps and and the sort of you know these guys. These incel guys are on dating apps too, right? right. It's not like when you swipe on Tinder or whatever, you're swiping on all really nice, educated, woke guys. You're, you're, well, educated isn't really the right word, but it could be anybody, you know? And so what I'm trying to say is like, there, I, I thought about this a lot. I think that one of the problems that we're seeing with the raising of young people now is there isn't enough shared experience, things that are beyond language. So much of life now is screens and, and the mediation of screens from people. You know, uh, your connection to someone is like through a screen, whether it's texting or on a site or DM or whatever, seeing their Instagram. Or, yeah, um, the way that people reach out to each other now, young people, is through liking something or, or, or you know, I feel that this has led to a further breakdown of understanding between all people, but especially boys and girls and people who identify in, in other ways as well, young people who identify in other ways. There's not as much shared experience and um, actual, you know, knowledge of another in, in, a, in a casual setting that feels comfortable. Mm -hmm. and, and school isn't necessarily it and, and and, and even sports aren't necessarily it. I just think there's less congregating among young people that feels like a way to get to know each other 
Mm -hmm. I wish there was there was more because the, one of the best ways to see some, another person as as a human being is to just have an experience with them, you know, whether whatever it is. And I think that parents could cultivate that more. And especially an experience where people will feel safe, where there's a gentleness to the experience and it's not going to be something threatening or scary or anything like that. But just that we know each other because we know each other. And and I'm not going to objectify her, my friend, because she's my friend. And I know mm -hmm. who she is. It's not she's not just somebody I see on Instagram or a dating app or or Facebook. She's this real person that I got to know through talking to her, through having a conversation with her. And that um, that isn't an old fogey speaking. That's somebody who's interviewed, you know, like really hundreds of, of young people and teenagers. And you ask them, what do you what do you do after school? And it's all online. Well, we do our homework online, we text online, we do this online. We do. It's I feel that if they knew each other better, and sometimes even when they are together, like a father told me he was driving along in his car, picked up four girls from soccer. And he said, this car is very, very quiet for having four teenage girls in it. And he looked in the mirror, mirror and they were all on their phones. Yeah. They weren't talking and they weren't interacting. So that is one thing that I, I do bemoan about modern life and the internet and, and social media and how it's led to a breakdown of shared experience between young people in which they would actually see each other as humans. Mm -hmm. Yes, I couldn't agree more. And I think part of the reason that happens, we are absolutely to blame for that as adults because we uh, stigmatize by sexualizing um, mixed sex relationships from a ludicrously young age. You have toddlers who sit down next to each other and we say, parents say things like, oh, they're on their first date, or I think oh. he has a crush. We say, I have a daughter, and from the time she was just tiny, do you have yeah. a boyfriend? You know, exactly. right? don't ask my kid that. How do you even know if she likes guys? She's two. Exactly. And what that teaches them is if you have a friend who happens to be of the opposite sex, it's embarrassing and people are going to stigmatize that relationship and it's going to be humiliating. And you can't really be friends with somebody of the opposite sex because of our kind of heteronormative societal obsession without this assumption that it's a sexualized relationship. And that drives kids from having those healthy platonic relationships that you've just described. I couldn't agree more. And I, the other thing, the other gulf that we healthy have. Platonic is relationships is such a good phrase. Yeah, it's so important for young people to experience so that they're not going down some rabbit hole where they're hearing that everybody who has a vagina is their enemy. You know, it's like, but wait, because if they do have those shared experience, they can say, but what about my friend? She's not like that. You right. Know? And the other thing in terms of that familiarity that's so important is that at the moment we are at this unique moment in history that's never happened before and will never happen again where a generation of non-digital natives is parenting and educating and raising a generation of digital natives. And there is a culture gap there, massive. These young people- Massive, they have no, a lot of parents have no idea. I'm, exactly, and educators, they have no idea. When you talk about online porn and you're right, kids are seeing online porn which did not push at them too like right. they go on a site that they think it's a like sometimes they're really little like they go on a site they think they're playing a game and like a porn thing pops up yeah. Exactly. They're not necessarily looking for it, but also what they're seeing. When I talk to parents and educators about online porn, they assume that you're talking about an online version of a Playboy centerfold, right? They think you're looking at a picture of a of a topless woman on a static page. And the yeah, real no idea it's like the craziest fetishism because what happened in the nineties and early two thousands was that it all got uh, you know, the algorithms made it all specific to certain acts you know. Yeah. So right now we know that one in eight of the available videos on very mainstream, easily accessible porn platforms show women being uh, raped, being coerced or having violent acts done to them without their consent. One well, eight. There's all this, there's all this, you know, um, studies and data that show that young people, young men who see that are more likely, it's true, to become violent you know, in bed, there's a real problem now. I've interviewed the women I've interviewed with just violence in bed, like just violence. And it has nothing to like, this isn't a guy that was like Elliot Roger and wrote a manifesto. This is just some guy you met on Tinder, or whatever. And then you get in bed with him and he starts like, yes. you know, I don't want to trigger anybody, but bad things happen. And it's very yes. common. 
And these and these guys are often vulnerable young men who have questions about sex, but instead of getting them answered, they've seen these videos online where sex is a man choosing to do something damaging and powerful and humiliating or degrading to a woman. To the extent that when I work with, with thousands of young people at schools, it's very common to hear them say things like, rape is a compliment really. It's not rape if she enjoys it. It's normal for girls to cry during sex. There was a rape case at a school I visited involved a 14 year old boy perpetrator and a teacher had said to him why didn't you stop when she was crying and he had said because it's because not that's what they do in porn that means they like it that's what he's I'm saying what was you know yes and and this isn't about kind of fetish websites this isn't kids deliberately visiting specific niche websites this is just a depiction on mainstream websites of what's normal and, and I think for boys as well that's very terrifying so there was yeah. this girl mm -hmm. she was and she wrote saying that she'd had sex with her boyfriend for the first time at university and just as you just described he'd started trying to throttle her halfway through and she had pushed him away and panicked and he had broken down in tears and said I'm so sorry I thought that was what you'd be expecting uh, yeah that's I mean yeah. you read my new book that's in my book that happened the exact same thing happened to me the exact same thing happened to me and I was old wow. when this happened and I I yeah. thought someone was trying to kill me but he was like, no, 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 wait a minute. I just thought that was what I was supposed to do. This is you it. Know, the, yeah. Sometimes the schools are, there needs to be, you know, education about porn too. Sometimes the schools are so out of it yeah. and, and don't talk about it. They, they called me to this school because the boys were going around with their cameras and taking what's called upskirt photos of girls and passing them around non-consensually, of course. And I got there and I said to the administration before I gave the talk, well, you know, this is porn. This is like a porn convention. It's a convention in porn. There are sites that are upskirt photos. They're doing something they've seen in porn. And they had no idea what I was talking about. Like, they, like what? Eighth graders don't watch porn. I'm like, are you kidding? You know, let's, let's take some more of these amazing questions. Oh, my God, my name is Stacy. Okay, but it's not your fault. I have never, <laughs> Stacey, it's not your fault. I have never heard of my name being used this way. I'm having increased sympathy for the Karens. That's another <laughs> issue. Do you have any suggestions, thoughts on how to de-escalate the misogynistic grooming without, again, encroaching on women's ability to discuss and celebrate their sexuality in a healthy manner? That's a good question. Yeah, I mean, I think we have to separate the two. So there is a, a world of difference between women who are choosing to um, portray themselves in whatever the way that they choose to online or artistically or whatever it is, and men who are doing it without women's consent. It's the dehumanization and the agency, I guess, behind what's going on that is critical. Is this women making choices for themselves or are these men trying to assert power and control over women to force them to behave in ways that those particular men choose to, to and also them. how much of sexualization self-sexualization is conditioning yeah so often i think the answer i always give to this question is um a, an individual woman can find it personally empowering to do certain things but it isn't necessarily something that is empowering for women as a whole that doesn't mean judging that woman it means looking at the society that we're operating in because when people go hey you know women all the time are choosing to self-sexualize as a form of empowerment you go okay but if there was nothing gendered going on there then we would well, expect I'm doing it human beings are doing this, right? If it was just yeah. that self-sexualization yeah. form of empowerment, we would expect to see equal numbers of men and women doing it. So let's have a look, for example, at the music industry and how many men are naked and writhing around on the floor in their own music videos. Oh, funnily enough, they're not. They're fully clothed in suits when they're singing. So something else is going on there. And that isn't to criticize any woman whose music video looks oh, like that. Of let's look at the bigger picture in which it's okay to say that there is something gendered going on here yeah. and not point the finger at individual women who have grown yeah. up in a society that is forcing them to behave in a certain way if they want to be successful but to tackle the society instead I think it's a red herring when we kind of uh, tear down individual women for the coping mechanisms that they adopt or the choices that they make within a patriarchal society instead of looking at the fact that by the age of five that's the age at which girls first start to worry about the size and shape of their bodies yeah. a quarter of seven-year-old girls have dieted to lose weight and the number goes up to 80 percent for 10-year-old 
old girls. And the number one magic wish of teenage girls in America is to be thinner. Yeah. So the, the bombardment of pressure from the world around us, the messaging that we receive from so young that our bodies are the sum total of our values, that how well we conform to a racist, heteronormative, uh, anti-disabled standard of, of what it means to be a beautiful woman is from an incredibly young age drilled into us as the single most important thing about who we are as women and how successful we're likely to be. So within that context, you don't then point your finger at an individual woman who is making individual choices and go, I think she's the problem actually, because she's doing all this stuff. You go, let's look at the system and dismantle that before we start. Well, that's exactly, that's exactly what, I mean, almost, yes, exactly what I would say to uh, moms, uh, when they would say to me, I, I would say, you know, give talks and say, well, unsolicited dick pics, which are so common now, or asking for nudes is not okay. You got to teach your sons. Don't send girls dick pics and do not uh, ask them for nudes yeah. because it's, it's offensive, if not abusive to say, send me nudes, you know, but then inevitably some mom in the audience would always raise her hand and say, but girls just send my boy nudes without him asking for them. The girls send unsolicited nudes as well. And, and I would say, then it's a teaching moment when you don't slut shame the girl and say, um, you know, what a disgusting girl who did that to you. It, 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 it's, it, it's jarring to get an unsolicited nude, no matter who you are. And, and, and I, and I feel for your son, but it's a teaching moment where you can raise a feminist or raise a sexist and get him to understand what's going on in our culture that this girl who sent him this thinks that this is what she needs to do to get his attention, to make him like her, to feel that this is what he, that she feels that this is what he wants without even being asked. Let me go, let me go to this, these um, other issues in your book. Um, I want to talk about domestic abuse and terrorist attacks more because I think that that is something that we, we touched on, but we glossed over a little bit. There is this connection. So many times I see when there's an attack or, or something and we, we go to, I see on Twitter, women start digging into the past of this man. He's always a domestic abuser. What's going on there? Well, domestic abuse is a form of everyday terrorism, right? It's the same thing, it's just on a different scale. We're talking about somebody who chooses to use power and control and fear and violence to get what they want, essentially, to assert control. That is the same thing happening in the daily lives of women who experience abuse and also something that happens on a much bigger stage when someone carries out a terrorist attack. So it, it, it's unsurprising, it makes sense that there is a link there. It also, I think, ties into the links if we're looking at terrorist attackers, particularly white supremacists, um, white men terror attackers who are likely to have this backdrop of, of gendered violence, that these are men who often believe that they are entitled to this kind of superior position in society. And that is something that enacts itself in their relationships with women personally, and also in their bigger relationship with the world. What it means, and this comes back to canaries in the coal mines, is that women are literally dying silently, unheard and uncared about. And then later on, the person that murdered them or the person that abused them or stalked them or raped them goes on to buy a bigger gun and to murder tens or hundreds of people. And suddenly at that point, we clamor and, and we're in uproar about it because they've killed men as well, right? And people, mm -hmm. men, and it's just- and let's not forget kids. Kids. And let's, These guys often kill their own kids too. But if women and children in the house. If we took domestic abuse seriously enough, for example, to enact a form of gun control that would prevent those men from ever, under any circumstances, accessing a firearm again, we would be like that, preventing around a third of mass shootings if we cared enough to really tackle this. Or if we took domestic abuse seriously enough culturally and societally to mean that the people who had been abused by this man were able to come forward and known that they would be taken seriously seriously and supported and find justice, which of course is often not the case in the criminal justice system as it stands at the moment, even less so for victims who are women of colour, who are sex workers, who are trans women. 
if those victims were taken seriously and supported, then we would find many more of these men prevented from going on to commit further atrocities. But also, if you look at it in terms of prevention rather than reaction, if we taught every child at school about respect, about sexual consent, about healthy relationships and what they look like, if we were doing really, really good, high quality anti-racist and anti-sexist education with young people, because we could it's all, connected. it's all connected. Because it's all connected. And in so many schools in the US, all they have is abstinence only education, often state funded, which we know does nothing to reduce the rates of sexually transmitted infections or lower the age horribly. Of sex. We know it doesn't stop teen pregnancies. If anything, it just increases the shame and the stigma around these conversations. And it, it disempowers young people because it takes away their opportunity to ask questions and to learn about this stuff in a healthy way. And and then, as we've discussed, they're turning to online porn and extremist male communities online for the answers instead. And we can see where that goes. And one thing I think a lot of parents don't quite understand, parents don't understand, you know, like the song, is that, um, uh, you know, a lot of parents get very, uh, they feel uh, very comforted when they see these studies, which come out a lot in the last few years, saying young people are having less sex. Mm -hmm. that's that must be good right well I don't know if it's good or bad but it's kind of inaccurate I mean I, I if you if these studies very often are just about the amount of you know part of the expression intercourse that people are having but I don't think there's any less sex if you understand that sex now is also cyber sex and mm -hmm. when young people grow up on the screens their first introduction to sex is porn and cyber sex which involves you know, just send me a nude and, 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 you know, pleasuring oneself to the nude or having hot chat, you know, with someone who you don't even really know that well. This is the disembodying, the disconnection, the alienation of the whole first introduction to sex. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it, it's not that people, it's not that young people are having less sex, in my opinion. They're just having different kinds of sex, which yeah. are less about connection, phys uh, emotional connection and physical connection and actually getting to know someone and respecting them as a person and finding yeah. out what they like and what they want to do and, you know, all that kind of stuff that you learn slowly. You know, I, I in schools I say, how many people in here have ever um, sent or received a nude? Don't worry, your teachers aren't looking. And like half the room will raise their hands. How many people in here have ever held hands with someone? Not a single hand. And that's mm -hmm. happened every single time. So, you know, that might sound old fashioned and romantic, but that these like baby steps you take towards sex, sex, no matter what gender sexual orientation you are as a young person, the, the little steps that you take towards getting to know someone and finding out what sex really is, is um, unfortunately, I think, really disappearing. Mm -hmm. And I think that the act of opening up those conversations with young people and giving them the opportunities to talk about those things can start from a very young age and can be very little. Just as you said, it doesn't have to be one big scary conversation that parents have. It can be starting, you know, it's funny when we talk about how can you talk about sex with young people, people say it shouldn't happen. It shouldn't happen until they're teenagers because we can't talk about sex with kids. But interestingly, no one has a problem with talking to three or four year olds when they first go to daycare and saying you don't hit other children right no one says but we can't talk to kids about violence it's just common oh, yeah. sense that you break it down into age appropriate building blocks but you can do that with this stuff as well right you can learn at that age and you get to decide what happens to it and that's someone else's body that's and we can do that in our relationships with children and where we ask them if we can give them a hug or a kiss we don't force them to hug and kiss relatives if they don't want to you know we can model that idea about consent and bodily autonomy and we can also familiarize ourselves with the reality of children's lives and and this is an answer to the question about um there's a question about what advice for parents trying to have discussions with their boys i think finding young people where they are and being aware of the reality of their lives is very important before you even start these conversations. Yeah. So in the book, I give a lot of detailed examples of this and of kind of specific red flags that parents can look out for in the language of their teens. So for example, words like uh, triggered 
words like normies, which is the word that these groups use to describe people in the real world. Um, those terms, Chad, Stacy, Becky, words like red pilled, black pilled, blue pilled, um, often words like snowflake and woke, um, but also being aware of any kind of really sudden behavioral change in your child, particularly a sudden intolerance to alternative viewpoints can be another really big red flag. If any of those things are happening, they might be an indication that they've come into contact with these forms of extremism. But another way to really kind of be aware of it and have it on your radar, I think, as a parent is to immerse yourself in the online worlds where these things are happening. So sign up to some yeah. of the meme accounts, the comedy meme accounts on Instagram. Take yourself onto YouTube for half a day and let yourself drift down the rabbit hole of the algorithm and see where it takes you. Start with something really tame about women or about feminism and see what videos get automatically queued up. Yeah. And all of this will give you an idea and a context from which to start those conversations, which I think is grounding for a teenager. Yes, and it will bring you closer to your child. It'll make you... Um, have a better relationship it's scary you know it's awkward perhaps you might feel uncomfortable in the beginning but it's look i can tell you somebody that talks to kids about social media they want to talk about social media they don't once you open up the door they won't shut up about it because it's so much part of their lives and there's so many things going on and sometimes they would talk so fast i couldn't even understand what they're saying i have to go home and, and like listen to the tape like five times because like what because i'm because blah, 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 they need to talk about it and they want to talk about it and when it comes to sex you know i've thought a lot about you know i don't blame my parents or my mother they were of a different generation and they didn't know how to have these conversations but i really wish that they had because i think it would have saved me a lot of trouble and danger and a lot of things that happened to me way before the internet. If somebody had said to me like, this is not okay, if someone says this to you, um, how do you feel about this? Is anything going on that we should know about? You know, it, it's it's the kind of thing that like, I, I would have felt like I was protected. And, you know, protection is something that uh, in feminism is a, a some feminists think of it as a kind of a dirty word, but when you're talking about children, it's not. It's absolutely our job to protect them. Mm -hmm. And protect them just be from talking. And I think you are so right to, to flag up that sometimes those things might seem very simple. So somebody saying to a child, this isn't okay, it might seem obvious, but it's really important to realize that for many young people, because what they're seeing online is so extreme, it might be quite revolutionary for someone to say, and I think the best example of this for me is, it is possible for a boyfriend to rape you. Yes. Yeah forces you to have sex when you don't want to that's rape and a rapist isn't just a stranger in a dark alleyway waiting to play prey on girls who are silly enough to wear short skirts and stray into their path which is what the world tells girls is the case rape is something that happens to careless girls who are silly and they don't follow the rules and do the things that we know they need to do to keep themselves safe that message is so pervasive that many of the girls that I work with teenage girls who have been raped repeatedly or who are in abusive relationships don't recognize and would never use the terminology rape or sexual assault or domestic violence to describe what's happening to them all because it's my boyfriend and if it's your boyfriend you have to have sex with him right so telling just that our society still tells them that could could have a huge impact for young people and also you can say no at any time at, at any time you're allowed to say no you must say no if you want to say no because just because something started doesn't mean you can't stop it when you stop feeling comfortable. And that wasn't even the law in the United States in all 50 states until recently. And you making know. sure that boys know about checking in with a partner and, and yeah. checking how they feel and actually making sure that young people of all genders, but particularly because we don't often tell boys this, we focus so much on telling girls to say no, that because of exactly what you've described, this kind of idea that is now modeled for young people, that sex is something that, that you do for kind of your own pleasure rather than a mutual pastime. I think it's really important to drill down on that idea of, of always knowing where your partner's at and what they want and boys recognizing that actually someone who isn't consenting won't necessarily be able to say no verbally and you need to be picking up on other cues. And if you're not sure, checking in with them and making sure that you know what's going on all of this is is education and, and context that we are not currently giving young people. And so they're adrift, of course. And they don't always know even like how to connect with themselves. 
everything is on the screen. Yes. And they're just doing what they see is done, what the conventions are to do, like a picture, do a this, do a that. But they're not really seeing, they're, they're copying and imitating. Social media culture is culture, right? Yeah. And they're being inculcated into this culture, which is often very much about toxic masculinity. And it's created by the, the Rotopia of, of Silicon Valley, too. I mean, that's like for another yeah. discussion, but that's part of the whole problem is that these platforms have been, have been created by young white guys in the main who, you know, yes. don't have to think about how this affects women, people of color, because they're white guys. And I saw this great meme, if I if you indulge me for a second, because I love this. It was a it was a, a true representation of the domino effect. And down here in the little dominoes it said Mark Zuckerberg starts a site to rate women on campus, which was of course the precursor to Facebook called Face Mash. That's what the original Facebook. And then the dominoes go, and then the big domino, the last domino is there's a guy in a horned hat pooping in Nancy Pelosi's office. Yeah. Like, that's it. I, I, I get that connection. And I get that connection in part because I read your book, your wonderful, wonderful book. These things are all related. So let me see. I think we, oh, let's talk about the feminist men's movement and mm -hmm. the men working against these. Oh, yeah ideologies let's talk about that because that is really interesting too yeah this is kind of beautiful and, and hopeful but also tragic because well, let's, there, let's end on this like yeah it's a, it's a hopeful it's a good note to end on you're right so yeah. there is a feminist a good guy. And, um, a, a powerful movement which uh, started in the kind of late 1960s and the early 1970s in the US as a kind of um, partner to the, the burgeoning second wave feminist movement. And it was a movement of men who believed very strongly that it was their role to help um, prevent violence against women and tackle gender inequality in our society. But they also were interested in exploring the negative impact of gender stereotyping, for example, on men. And they created created kind of men's talking circles that were a kind of counterpoint to the, the feminist consciousness raising circles of the time. And they believed that both men and women could be liberated by looking at gender inequality and the role that men could play in tackling it in their own lives and their own sphere, but also obviously the knock on effect it had on women. And there was a young man who was um, named, who was quite a kind of powerful figure in this movement, who ended up um, becoming name appointed to the board of the National Organization for Women. And at some point, there was a kind of schism where they staked their opposition to the presumption of shared custody in divorce cases. And he kind of split from the movement and suddenly started talking about men and their needs and how actually he thought that it was men that were really being undermined and that women had all of the power and the sexual capital in society. And he wrote this book called The Myth of Male Power, and it kind of split the movement in two. And suddenly this guy who had been the kind of media darling, the, the sort of- Tell us, uh, tell us his name. This is Warren Farrell, who oh. was seen as the kind of, this kind of hero of the feminist movement for a time, suddenly just kind of turned into this person who believed that actually it was men who were really disadvantaged and men who were really being, um, discriminated against in our society and and behind him came an explosion of organizations around father's rights and men's rights particularly in Australia they were kind of early adopters of this movement but also in the US in the UK and further afield and and on and on it grew until you reach the point where you have the men's rights movement as it exists today but what's really sad and also hopeful is that there is this this beautiful remaining kind of branch of the men's movement that is a real anti-sexist feminist movement of men fighting to support women and to tackle sexism in all its forms and although it is much less noisy and headline grabbing than its kind of evil twin it remains to this day a, a, a community so you've got organizations like Promundo which globally looks at engaging men and boys to tackle gender inequality you've got organizations like the White Ribbon Alliance starting in Canada by Michael Kaufman. Here in the UK, we have organizations like the Good Lad Initiative, where young men go into schools and talk with boys about sexual consent and all of yeah. these things. There is a movement of men yeah. fighting back. And I think that's and it's beautiful because I, I get those emails too. And and they say, I, I want to do something. What do I do? And um, they are um, men who get it. 
and they understand and they care and we need them. Yes, and they are, of course, the vast majority. There is a critical mass of men who would yes. never dream of behaving. Well, they, they could get mobilized a little more. Exactly, but we need to mobilize them. If we could engage that critical mass of men, if we could rescue them from the kind of not all men mob who are trying to pull yeah. them the other way, then we could see real change because there would be that momentum of kind of cultural shift. Well, we shouldn't rest on the, you know, the idea that again, circling back to what we were discussing before, that like feminism kind of fixed everything and it's all good now. I mean, that's just not the case. I recently, uh, uh, there was a, a study that said, um, in if things continue the way they are, this is about income inequality, inequality, but still it's related. If things continue the way they are, then in, it'll take 200 years mm -hmm. for women to achieve income equality. It'll take 200 years. So I'm sitting at dinner um, with my, you know, then, you know, like 20 year old daughter and some other people. And one of them was this young guy, 30 something guy. He's like a DJ or something, friend of a friend. And he says, well, that's pretty good, right? 200 years, that's not bad. <laughs> I was just like, what? Like, how are you gonna say that to this 20 year old girl entering the workforce, 20 year old woman, sorry, entering the workforce that it, like in her lifetime, she'll never achieve income in equality, but in 200 years, like her great grand, great, great grandchildren will. How can you say that? So I think that, um, yeah, this, and, and it really like the look on his face was like, oh yeah, you're right. I mean, I think that if we, we continue to um, educate our young male friends and all of this and, and get them into educating each other, it's yeah. so important. Definitely. Men talking to other men, which is what these guys set up in the 1970s, is really crucial. And, and every one of those men who asks, what can I do? How can I help? It, it's about disrupting the normalization uh, amongst other men that, that this particular entitlement to power and control, whether it's over women's bodies or whether it's, it's uh, racialized forms of harassment and abuse, that they aren't normal and that they can be disrupted and that perhaps they're best disrupted by other men. Yeah. My favorite example of this is the guy who wrote to the Everyday Sexism Project to say that the project had opened his eyes to women's experiences of street harassment and how awful they were. And a few days later, he was walking down the street and two guys working on a construction site started shouting at women about 10 yards ahead of him. And they were screaming, get your tits out. And he said he panicked and he froze and he thought, I wanted to give them this, this great speech about why it was wrong, but all of that rushed out of my head. And in a panic, I just lifted up my t-shirt and I showed them mine instead. And yes. it was because it was a tiny, silly thing that he did, but it, it said- made other guys think. It said to those, exactly. It said to those other guys, you wouldn't do this to me. It would be ludicrous. So why are you doing it to them? And that's what we need. Those tiny everyday acts of rebellion and disruption of normalization to, to create the shift that we need to see to, to disrupt the way in which this stuff is still seen as just normal and the way things are. Everyday sexism was such a great name. It's, it's, it's really says it all. And your work is so important. And I, I think this is I'm feeling like hopeful all of a sudden. So I feel like I want to just end this on this hopeful note. Is there anything else that you want to say or should we take one more question? I don't know if there's, oh, I don't, I don't think we have any more questions. Yeah, yeah, I think we've, we've got through all the questions. We did the questions. <laughs> and um, yeah, I, I, I really urge everybody to get Laura Bates book, um, Men Who Ate Women. It's, it's so important. You'll use it as a reference book. You'll you'll give it to your friends. You'll have to buy another copy, but that's okay. And um, yeah, it's been an honor talking to you. And you, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for your brilliant questions. And thank you everyone who came and listened and, and gave these amazing questions. And I'm gonna read the comments now that I have a chance. <laughs> well, thank you both. Um, I really enjoyed this and I learned a lot. Um, I, you know, it gives me hope too. Um, as a man who is doing this work with other men um, and in multi-gendered community, it is always exciting to me um, to see like, yeah, we can make other choices. We can deprogram um, people. You know, I, I think we have to, I have to believe that there is hope for, for white people to do anti-racist work, for men to do feminist work, um, because otherwise, you know, we can't, we can't go on without hope. And I think, you know, you've really offered some, some clear-eyed assessment for where there are some some places for hope, right? And I think the first step for any 
uh, program of rehabilitation is really seeing the, the lay of the land. And this book offers so much of that. So um, I'm very, um, thank, thank you both so much. Uh, I hope you stay safe and well. And, um, Hi, and until next time, take care. Thank you, thank you so much, both of you, thank you.